Welcome to BYOD. My name is Vladimir Radovanov, and my co-host should be right on her way. Hey, I'm here. I'm here. What are we doing? Um, are we I'm, rolling? Yeah, yeah. I'm just uh, introducing the show. Oh. Welcome to Bring Your Own Donuts. Um, here. It's Bring Your Own Doc. Oh, thank God. I wouldn't have known what to talk about with donuts. I was wondering why you asked me to co-host the show. I can talk about docs. Well, on that note, let me introduce my co-host. She's the only filmmaker to have won the Sundance Grand Jury Prize <coughs> two times, and while she's been called many things, Movie Line calls her the culture-watching, footage-hoarding obsessive. Please welcome Ms. Andi Timoner. Hi. Thank you for tuning into our talk show, BYOD, Bring Your Own Doc. Hi, welcome back. Um, maybe we should talk a little bit about how we met. So, um, so here's, here's how we came to do this show. Um, many, many years ago, it's actually something like 15 or 16 years ago. At least. I was filming a little movie that I didn't know what was going to become of it uh, called Dig. Um, we have it. Dig. And, um, and I was filming, I was like two weeks into filming, and I was at the Viper Room. Right? Yeah, I was and at that show. It was a notorious night. Uh, came to be a great scene in the movie. But, uh, and maybe we should play a scene from it. And yeah. then I can explain how we met. Yeah, yeah. Why don't uh, we roll that clip? Basically, I needed legal. I'll just beat you up if you don't stop stepping on their mics, man. They don't like that. Pick that shit up. Bring them up. Pick the fucking shit up and quit. Hey, you fucking asshole. You get, off, you get out of here, too. I'll play by myself, Dean. You go have a drink. Bye. Watch. <laughs> Sitar, you okay, man? Yeah, I'm okay. Did you get hurt? Is that blood on you? Yeah. From where? From Your people's hand. faces. He wants to be a rebel. He doesn't want to conf So, um, so right after that moment when he says blood on people's faces, a 400-pound bouncer named Ed comes out the door of the Viper Room and says, give me the tape. Yeah, and, and, and so Andy asked me if, uh, I would try and recover the tape, and at the time I was just a law student, and I told her, you know, I'm only a law student. She said, just step up, do it. So uh, I went out there and I lied, said I was a lawyer, threatened uh, to call the DA to bring him down for, you know, theft and to sue them for um, conversion, which is basically taking someone else's property and destroying it. And that wasn't the first time that, um, that Vlad came to my rescue to get masters back. Um, we have other incidences like uh, with We Live in Public where he had to step in mafia style and get him back. So I always call him my mafia lawyer. He's, uh, he comes in and fixes things. But I was 23 years old at the time, crying on the sidewalk. And if it wasn't for Vlad, I, would, I don't know if we would have that scene in Dig. Um, so that started our, our, our relationship. And we've gone on and collaborated, and especially on We Live in Public, yeah. where Vlad is the executive producer of We Live in Public. And, We've been distributing that film sort of ourselves for a couple years now. And I think that's what inspired us to create a show about documentaries. Absolutely. Is that um, we feel like there's two sides to documentaries. There's the creative side, which is a, often a really long process of following lives, of trying to catch the serendipity of life as it's happening. And then there's the edit. And the edit is, uh, in my case, can be thousands of hours of footage. Um, in most cases, it's hundreds of hours of footage. And, uh, and then there's the score. And, um, and that actually, you know, 
is what we're going to talk about today, how we score films. And we have a very special guest uh, who's a composer that we'll bring on in a second, an award-winning composer. Um, but there's a business side. And the business side is increasingly an interesting field as the internet takes over. And also as there's fewer, you know, our economy's in the dumps, let's face it. Right. And so documentaries, nobody's really wanting to finance them per se. Uh, yeah, or films in general. It's really difficult in the uh, current market to get financing for any film. Yet, we had the advent of reality TV in our lifetime. And we're not going to reveal our age, but clearly we've been around for a little while. And so I remember when, you know, documentaries, when I started, you couldn't even watch, uh, yeah. you know. Uh, you, you, you couldn't get a documentary watched by anybody but like a PBS audience. Absolutely. Basically. Documentary meant like eating spinach or reading history books or something that was far too educational to be entertaining. And then with reality TV, people said, oh, maybe real life can be interesting. You right, know? right. Um, and it opened the door in a lot of ways for people to watch documentaries. And documentaries had this golden age, which we are still in. So why don't we uh, take a look and talk about the definition of a documentary? OK. So a documentary film, a film or TV program presenting the facts about a person or event. So I mean, I guess you could say that reality television, documentary films, in some ways share many things. But it says presenting facts objectively without editorializing or inserting fictional Wh matter. Which isn't always the case. That is really not the case. Um, chronology is often needs to be tweaked uh, for storyline. Um, some people don't believe in that. A lot of people do. Uh, now we have the mockumentary, we have scenes, we have reenactments that are shot. And if you talk about reality TV, many documentary filmmakers resent reality TV for mostly two things. One, you can't afford anyone anymore to work right. on your documentary because reality TV pay, pays so well. Right. And the second reason is, um, is that reality TV is not really real. It's very scripted and it's very you know, pat, and it usually has to do with a carrot, you know, that everybody's competing and usually demeaning their humanity in some way and scraping along, jumping into a bucket of worms or what have you for that free Cadillac. Um, whereas documentaries are our greatest hope for a look at what's happening in the world today. And so our hope is that with this show, we will be able to take a look at the cutting edge stories of what's happening in the world today and also share a little bit about what it is to try to get those movies made and to get those movies out there. Yeah, and, and for all of you aspiring filmmakers out there and composers, editors, lawyers, just to give you a little insight about what the business is and how to become part of the business and what it takes and, and to show you how some of us who have become part of this community got to where we're at today. Okay, so let's stop babbling okay. and introduce our fantastic guest. Let's do it. Who happens to be in town because he is the uh, nominee for the best composer of a film called Better This World at the International Documentary Association Awards tonight. And we need to get him out of here in about an hour, so we're not going to take up too much time of his time. But this, uh, this particular gentleman is actually an old friend of mine. His name is Paul Brill, and he has been nominated three times for Emmys. Um, he has scored pictures that you may have heard of, like Joan Rivers' piece of work, The Trials of Daryl Hunt, the Devil Came on Horseback, page one inside the New York Times. And Better This World, if you haven't seen it, it just won the Gotham Awards the other night. And it's an absolutely incredible uh, story about politics, youth, idealism, rebellion, everything, life. A good documentary usually spans many topics. Anyway, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Paul Brill. Hey. Hey, Paul. I brought you some donuts. Oh, for it's your actually, show. I'm so sorry. Remember you called and said there was going to be a donut show? Uh, yeah, I actually Sustainer. brought some too. <laughs> well, you're it's luck, actually Paul. a documentary show. Oh, that's yeah. not a comedy special. I was like, <laughs> oh, thinking that since you were in town, you could come by and we could talk about donuts. I love donuts. I know. So do I. Um, so Paul actually had to eat a lot of donuts uh, growing up uh, because yes. he didn't have any money. I lived on a donut farm. And he lived on a donut yes. farm. Thank you very much. <laughs> It's great and to be back here at the Aloha Lounge. <laughs> Thank you. A great audience. And all bands eat donuts, right? It's, is it yes. police that eat donuts? I, or is I think bands probably. Oh, look at this one. It's like with um, nuts. We were just, someone said that Altadena makes the best donuts in America. Altadena's not making anything. Uh, we had this <laughs> massive windstorm and Altadena's out of business. Better days. We make milk without oh. any kind of you know, pesticides. That's just a prop, by the way. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'll put this down. It's real. Oh. Yeah, they're good. Okay. okay. Um, so, Paul, well, yes. can you tell us a story? Tell us about. Yeah, I, I want to hear about the the early days. I'm a huge fan. I've got a okay. Full disclosure. I am a huge Paul Brill fan. Um, from early on, my friend uh, Chris Campbell, the gunslinger, who, the gunslinger, the gunslinger. yeah, yeah. Um, who I call Henerolissimo because uh, he always tells me to stand accused, and he would so accuse me of not saying his name on the show right now. He introduced me to the <coughs> music of Paul Brill, uh, who at that time had a band called SF Envelope, and um, it, I just loved it instantly. And it, had I been actually in a position to put it in a film at that time, I would have. Um, but we're talking about the early 90s. That would have been a much here. different film than Dig. Yes, it would have been very <laughs> mellow and relaxing. Yes. yes. There wouldn't have been much fighting going on. Um, so, so tell me about like that. Uh, should we play? Should we play a little taste of it for maybe get some new fans for the band? <laughs> sure. We'll get up into uh, over ten people possibly. Awesome. Because I'm feeling lonely here. Yes. Let's okay. Rock. Let's listen to it. Yeah. Are we talking while this is happening? Okay. No. Right, well. See, we're we're out of Sounds like a Santa Fe. The kind of river that nice. would be in a desert region. Yeah. Like a slow this, puddle. Yeah. Like a this is slow a puddle. <laughs> Doesn't it sound <laughs> yeah. very this slow? Is fun, this, is a, this, is a good, this is a fun band. Really it was really good. How many, this uh, is not at all drug inspired. No. No, no it wasn't. This is dawn inspired or yeah. dusk. It, it was morning. Morning. I was morning. In the river. Do you, you always write in the morning? No. Okay. Now I don't know. I just write all day, not this kind of stuff. That was great. We're back. We were back. We were here the whole time. <laughs> um, so then, so tell me about that, and then what happened after that. Well, so you, then I know. Then I remember seeing you solo. Okay. And then next thing I know, yeah. you're oh. at some documentary festival, and I run into you at some after party or something, and I want to understand how that all happened. There's a long. It's it's a long trajectory, and full of serendipitous turns along the way, honestly. So that band went on for a while, and we, uh, we didn't quite make it in the rock world. We actually lived in Los Angeles for a time, and then that band, mostly in San Francisco. And then that band broke up, and I moved back to New York, ultimately. Can I ask you how yeah. long you were playing in that band? I think maybe three years, three or four years, something like that. And then I moved back to New York, I had no idea what I was going to do, and I was actually really burnt on playing music at all. I was kind of, I kind of mm. stopped playing music. I just didn't feel inspired. I did the whole like major label back back then when they had major labels, record labels. Right. You know, we did a dance and you know dog and pony show for them every week. You know, it'd be like the new I and R guy would come and check you out and try to get them to take you to give dinner. You money. It was, fortunately that that whole system is toast and so farewell to those people but um anyway so I, I landed in New York and within a week of being in New York I got a job working at a small middle school in East Harlem for disadvantaged oh. kids a small school of like 55 kids and I worked there I, I, I interviewed to be a music teacher a part-time music teacher but the guy, after this long talk I had with the founder of the school, he said, you know, we don't really have money for that. <laughs> you know, we don't have money for anything, but if you want, you can be our development director and help with this and that, write grants. And I said, sure, even though I had no idea what that even meant. I, I had to, like, look it up on the internet. And I got were, were you just looking for a job, just something away from music? I didn't even know. Yeah. I just was totally out there, like, just arrived. I drove cross country with my girlfriend, now wife, and... Uh, I got. I always thought, hey, if I could teach music, that would be cool. I, I like working with children. I've worked with kids when I was younger. Anyway, so I got that gig, and I ended up there for six years. And I kind of stopped playing music for a little while. I started doing some recording in the middle of that and towards the end. But then that school was a crazy place where all these famous people would come. Right. And how a Tom Brokaw taught a class <laughs> once a week at the wow. school. Reggie Jackson came. Paul Newman came in to the kitchen because I used to cook lunch for the kids once a week. He came in and asked me about my recipe. And here I was like a failed <laughs> musician. What recipe? Uh, 
I was my own little like peanut butter sesame. <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, you called it you called it the school of rock, right? And no, I mean it, it was kind of like that, but it was uh, it was just it's an amazing school. It's called the East Harlem School at Exodus House. East Harlem, yeah. my people, East Harlem. Oh. I love it, it's a special place. And anyway, so I was there for a number of years, and then I kind of, I, I, I was wondering what I was gonna do, and I got that sucked back into music. I couldn't get away from it, and I have a couple of friends That's because you're a musician. I just couldn't stop. Was it, was, it, well, was it that you would play? <laughs> yeah, I just, it was. <laughs> when you say you got sucked back in, did you just start playing out? At I had a band, I had a, I had a band during all this, but we, okay. we had a bluegrass band at one point, and it was called Milkweed, <laughs> and yeah, <laughs> and I mean, we were just, it was just goofing around. I learned a lot of old time Western stuff, Western swing, and just having a good time. And then I recorded a record, and I had a couple friends who were living in Portland, um, and Oregon, and we're doing commercial writing, and you know, scoring for picture and that kind of thing, and we're making some money in that. I didn't even know that was possible. I didn't know anything about that side of the, the, the lens. So you're talking about like Eric from the Dandies? Or? Um, no, I, that, it, some other people. They're in a band now called um, Stereo Vision. Okay. But they're still there, and they're great friends of mine, Dave Camp and Nancy Hess, and I was like, man. They're, they're working on music every day. This is what they do every day. They wake up and they go and they have a commercial job or whatever they're doing and they play their guitars and they off it goes and they're making thousands of dollars doing this. And it wasn't about the money, but I was just saying, dang, I gotta get, I wanna well, do something like that. If it was about the money, you would be scoring commercials it, and not docs, right? Well, I did commercials. <laughs> oh, okay. But it was, it's never about then the once money. You I just wanted fortune, to work. My goal was always to make a living playing music. That's what I always wanted right. to do. So anyway, um, I then, this is funny, I was playing a gig at CBGB's mm -hmm. in New York, and this guy comes up to me after the show, and he hands me a card, and he goes, he goes, I really like to, and you actually, you, you know this, I really like to use your songs in this movie, I'm a music supervisor, and we'd like to, and he handed me his card and said, G-Spot Productions. <laughs> it's like, I handed it to my wife, and she's like, that is a, that's a porn movie. Yeah. That's a porn movie. That's you're a going big to be, You're going to be scoring a porn movie. It wasn't. It was, this, it was a romantic comedy that you right. saw here in LA called Way Off Broadway. And it was the first film I was involved with where they just used my songs. It was, and it was, I was totally hooked from that moment. I was like, that is what I want to be doing. Did they Why? just, did they use, can I? No, yes, let's yeah. duke it out. Okay. Yeah. You go first. Okay, did they, uh, <laughs> did they use songs that you'd already written? Yes, there were existing band? songs okay. from, my, from not that record. The next record I did that, my first solo record okay. that I did in New York. And then you asked why that I was hooked? Yeah, well, was it seeing your, your songs married to images? Part of it. And then also just, I love the collaborative element of it. Just it wasn't only about me. And then as I got deeper into writing, that's what really thrilled me about filmmaking and being involved in that side of it. But first I did a documentary film after that, which also used pre-existing songs of mine. That was called Mother Trucker. A friend of mine named uh, Katie Brown made this film. Really cool film. I and like we the used name. Mother, we Trucker. Used Mother we, Trucker. Yeah, it was a good movie. <laughs> and we used my songs that were from records, but this time I took the vocals off and just did instrumental and kind of tweaked them a little bit. I was like, ooh, that's kind of interesting, you know? Made a whole different feel. And then the next, the next thing that happened to me was really the event that changed my life and, and my career as an adult. Um, in a different way, I mean, I, you say that about the East Harlem School, that was a life-changing event as well. But this serendipitous moment where I got a chance to do The Trials of Daryl Hunt, which is an HBO film that Ricky Stern and Andy Sumberg did, and they came to me and said, you know, we, we would like you to do this film, are you able to do that? And I was like, yeah, I think so. I haven't really scored a film before. But How did they find you? Well, um, Ricky Stern is actually my first cousin. It's a little known secret. <laughs> uh, no, um, but she's always been very um, supportive of my music and, and we've been close um, throughout my life. And I actually almost was gonna score her first, or one of her first films um, about a boxer in my corner. And she, when I first just moved to New York, she said, what do you think, you wanna try scoring this? And I, all I had then was like a drum machine <laughs> and an acoustic guitar and a four track. And I, was, I, was, I, I started writing stuff, I don't know what I'm doing here. Right. I really didn't know, but I had just done a record using Pro Tools for the first time when they approached me about Trials of Daryl Hunt. Pro Tools is recording gear for uh, audio. You know, it's right. kind of like Final Cut Pro or whatever. Most people know that. So it's kind of like avid. I was really experimenting yeah. a lot with ambient textures and soundscapes and mixing up beats and all sorts of stuff. And 
I said, yeah, we'll give it a shot. So they gave me a month to write without even picture. They showed me the trailer. And I said, all right, I'll give it a shot. And we sat down. We had this meeting in my apartment. This is after you've scored after, the trailer? No, they had, some, they just used they stock They had somebody music. else score the trailer. Right. It was just you know canned music. So they so had shot the film. They were shooting it. They, I mean, that film was shot over 13 years. OK. Yeah, so I mean, they, they, they were, got me beat. They were editing. <laughs> yeah. they Tens were, my top. Yeah, they were editing. Okay. And selling it and all this stuff, and HBO was kind of doing. So they made the trailer to sell the film. Them. Yes, they made the trailer. Um, they they were close to signing it with with HBO, and wasn't sure if it was going to be Cinemax or HBO. But Sheila and Evans was really into it, and that's a whole other story. They were great, but anyway, so I sat down I, and I presented my work after a month of writing, and I was I was just thinking at the moment. This is a this is a nexus moment. <laughs> this is either my relationship with my cousin is going to go south, and I'm not. It's going to be bad at Thanksgiving, or I'm going to do the, I'm going to do this movie. And they liked what I did, and we just went full hug. Can we show hug. a little bit so that people can yeah. catch up to? Uh, and this is this is actually one of the first pieces I think that I wrote. I think it might have been the first piece that I wrote. Um, this ended up being the opening of the film. Okay. And did you write this to picture at all? This I didn't actually. It, I didn't at first. I'd actually written it and was thinking about using it in a different part. And then the editor was very creative. This woman, um, Shannon Kennedy, she had great musical sense. Oh, yeah, She's yeah. wonderful. And she decided to plop it up against the opening. And after it fit in the opening, I did tweak it so like some of the hits would end at the big dramatic door closing. Right. And shit like that. So, okay. So let's yeah. let's let's roll look at the this. tape. So, uh, yes. Paul, yes, that was nice can you tell us, tell us what, oh, it was fantastic. Very a graphic. I, I don't think many people would think to put that score behind those images. No. And, I, and I'm thrilled for, for you and for, fi you know, that Ricky's your cousin. Because I think <laughs> Ricky and Annie are great filmmakers. And um, yeah, it's, so that tell was, me about, so what, what's the film about? Well, first I'll say I'm really fortunate that they were willing to let me kind of go off in a different direction that was not traditional at all, you know, that was not expected. And part of that is just by accident, you know, it was my first time scoring and I, I didn't come from a long history of doing it by the book, so I just kind of went, went for my gut. And I, I was really interested in those textures and mashing up like Indian um, sounds with, you know, traditional organic instruments, all that stuff. So, and, and it, it, I was glad it worked. You know? Did you play all those instruments? Most of it was programmed. Okay. You know, a lot of sampling and collaging and things like that. It's electronic stuff. Um, so the movie, this movie, 
in addition to just opening all these doors for me and like beginning my career, um, was a very personal and emotional journey for everyone involved because it's such a gripping and powerful story. It's about a man named Daryl Hunt who, when he was 19, was convicted in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina of a rape murder, uh, one of the most brutal rape murders in the history of the state. It was just awful. And he was innocent. And he got railroaded. And he, they found DNA evidence that was exculpatory 10 years after he had been in prison. And they still wouldn't let him out for another 10 years. And it took the filmmakers 13 years to make the film. It was incredibly moving. And the, they didn't even think they were going to be able to make the film until he actually got out. Like, they found the actual killer. It was incredible. And the guy confessed. On, like, the police didn't find him. Journalists found him by doing DNA matching. It was, it was amazing. So here it is, my first film. I got to meet this guy. He was a larger-than-life, amazing human being who's taught me so much. Because like, I've been on the circuit, you know, festivals with him. And we've, the film keeps playing. It lives on five years later. And, um, and on a personal level, like career-wise, like the film just it won all these awards. I got nominated for an Emmy for my first film, which was just completely <laughs> mind-blowing. I, I got that call. I, I was in disbelief. It rarely happens. Yeah, it was like beginner's luck. You're sitting at the poker table and you get dealt. Or not. Great, or, you know, yeah. yeah. or not. You were hardly a beginner. Yeah. yeah. But at, at this type of thing, I was. So it was, I mean, yeah. I mean, but I, is I put it, in my Is time. it that different? I mean, is it like. It's different. Okay. It is different. You know, I mean, it's a, what I love, what I was going to say is what I really like about scoring films is it's so much less about my vision. It's a collaborative vision. It's director's vision. It's the editor's and cinematographer. Where it's a team and you're coming together. And when I'm, I come from a rock and roll background where. And I'm a songwriter, so so much of it is me sitting with a guitar or piano, and what am I going to say? And it's about me, 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 and it's like I'm directing, and I'm. It's all my vision, and that's that can be cool if you're an egomaniac. No, or it's a cool thing just because as an artist, it's great direct expression. But working with a team, I get to play and sit back a little bit and and sculpt around what everyone else is doing and be a, in a supporting role. And, and I, I guess it's not And you for have everyone. those moments, though, where you are alone and you are composing before the director walks in, right? Yes. And it is your vision, or it's your vision of how, of what they envision, right? It's like you're. It is. And then it's, a, it's a push and pull sometimes, and sometimes it just hits, and sometimes there's a lot of. But back my and favorite forth. sessions, I mean, my, some of my favorite, favorite, favorite post sessions are with the composers. I mean, I just uh -huh. love it. It's probably because you're almost done with the film. <laughs> That's part of it. Yeah. <laughs> so can, can we talk about that yeah. process but, a little but bit? But part of it's getting the instruments out. Let's let Villar yeah. ask some questions. All right. Well, for the aspiring composers out there, you know, given that this was your first time composing, can you talk about what that means, the collaborative process? I mean, were you yes. in a room with multiple people while you were composing? Were you by yourself and then presenting, taking comments? What, what no, was I was that? very much by myself. And I usually am by myself, except for when I'm recording with other um, musicians, which is my favorite part, when right. I'm going in the studio. Um, and it, it can be great when you're following your gut. And sometimes you, you go down this road, and it's the wrong road. And the drive, you know, it really, you have to find a common language for the film. And it's, it's exciting. And a lot of times, you know, the, I come into a situation where there's there's music all over the film that's been temped. It's called temp music, and we were talking about directors have temp love, where they've been listening to the same like up in the air song <laughs> that's used for every film that they cut with, or or whatever. And they're like, but I really like that piece of music. Can you just do something like that? And then I'm wrestling with, well, you're hiring me as an artist to do something that supposedly I can do bring to it that's unique and 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 singular, and I have to kind of coax them along often and say, you know, we're going to develop our own language here. We're going to make our own voice for the film, and it's going to be its own deal, and it's going to be like nothing that's ever existed. And once that happens, it's a it, for me, it's a beautiful thing. And you sit in, this, in a theater, and you see your film, and it works, and it's all co cohesive, and the music really makes a, is a, is largely responsible for that, I think. And by coaxing, um, you also kind of look at the temp track, right? Because you can't just I know as a director, I, I suffer from temp love myself. Everyone does, yeah. <laughs> yes, and, uh, and the most effective moves composers have made with me is to take, is to take parts of that, yes. something, whatever the strain was that really inspired me, and to kind of pull that through and maybe ease me out of it that way, but, or stick with that. Sure. Um, and then Sometimes do you yeah. try to make a body out of the whole thing? Like, do you try to make the track that 
your second track that plays in the film correspond with like your 40th track? Yes, I do. I mean, if, if there's time and there's and there's a good arc to the story and it's already been cut and it's, there's a locked picture, that's a, definitely the goal. Like to be able to take themes and have them reappear in different forms and kind of guide you along. And I, honestly, the the best example, I, I, I mean, Better This World is a great was a film that had a lot of different thematic elements like that that kept reoccurring and kind of all fit together like a puzzle. Um, but one of the most unusual films I did was um, the Joan Rivers doc. Um, Joan Rivers, a piece of work. And what was interesting about that was it was one of the lightest films I've worked. It has a lot of dark elements to it because she's a complicated and complex woman. But the, the music was a lot lighter than a lot of these docs. I mean, I've been doing a lot of films about Darfur and people in prison and people in Burma, and, you know, and, and like other parts of East Africa, West Africa, like where there's genocides going on and, and crime and everything. So generally, you're going to have somber tones for that. But the Joan Rivers film, they came in right from the beginning. They said, we want this to be light. We want it to be, you know, kind of supportive. And what was interesting about that was that the music at the end of it ended up being just really kind of in the background in a way it should be mm -hmm. for me. I want to be, my goal is to be invisible when, I'm, when, when, I'm, when you're watching the film. Right. That's, I don't, just, that's a great goal. I don't want people thinking about the music. I want them to walk out of the theater and say, oh, you know, the music's really good. I don't, I don't remember any of it, but you know, <laughs> I know it was, it was good. Absolutely. And that, I felt like, really accomplished that. I don't think anyone was paying attention to the music, but it kind of just lightly moved the picture along. You know, it's, it takes you right. on that journey Which with, is with her. It, yes, what it's supposed to do. But, Let's look at it. Oh, good, good idea. But there were a lot of themes in that that we developed that kind of, and I did it with this woman, Amber. I had this woman, Amber Rubarth, come, who's a wonderful singer, and we spent the day writing like eight little pop songs, just going, do, 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 I know do, Amber. Do. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Oh, we'll have to have that talk. Yeah, we'll have the talk. And do, do, Let's do, just do, get do. it out. Let's he, talk about Amber. He, she's she's an amazing person. Really lovely. Great songwriter. Great she's a singer-songwriter. And a, a beautiful person. Like, really, really very sweet. How do you, how do you know Amber? She's actually a client. Awesome. Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to say something else. <laughs> uh, that's good. <laughs> He didn't define what we kind of client Angeles. she is. I don't know. I mean, You're assuming she's a legal client. Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> let's go to let's go to Joan Rivers. Let's watch a clip. Okay. So, Paul, how did you uh, capture the essence of an icon like Joan Rivers? As, you know, that was a, it was a difficult process because um, I, it took me a while to really grasp what this film was saying and what it was going to be about. And uh, Ricky and Annie had, 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 they had a very specific idea. They had a really good general idea from the beginning how they wanted it to sound. They wanted it to be light. They wanted a woman's voice. They wanted it to kind of have these sing-songy melodies. And, for me, that was really fun. It took it took a little bit of doing to find that voice. It took we we knocked heads a little bit. Ricky and I tend to, in a good way. That's good. And she's very um, hands-on and she has really strong ideas. So uh, 
once I found it, once it was really when I brought Amber in, we did that one session is when I knew like boom, this is gonna hit. And we brought some ukuleles in and some um, is some, that from the set? What we just heard is that from your first session? No, that actually is different. That was that was I'd done that in the beginning, and they liked that pretty much right off because they wanted this big rock opening, and uh, they were, they kind of like, yeah, that's pretty good. You know, I was <laughs> I was on the jury at Sundance when Joan Rivers, that. a piece of work, and I gave premiered. you that money to for to, <laughs> to, to now now <laughs> we're live on the internet. Oh yeah, sorry. I'm just kidding. Um, full, full disclaimer there. That didn't happen. He gave me money for something we can't talk about. Yes, something that we no. a lot. <laughs> don't donuts. believe anything. Don't believe for those anything. For those Salt Lake donuts. City has the best donuts. Yep. So they say. Um, yeah, we went down to Salt Lake. That's also something we shouldn't talk about. Yeah, we'll leave that alone. But, um, but no, I, I remember sitting down with the jury. Um, I remember exactly seeing that film and just being blown away. I loved it. And uh, I don't know. I think... You know, we we had 15 or 16 films, but it was just, it was the kind of thing where I think it was the only film that we obviously, obviously had to stay for the Q&A because Joan was there. Yes. You know, and, and she was ripping it up, too. She was hilarious. Oh, my gosh. Um, she was. But ridiculous. your opening was totally effective, you know, just you. smashed right in. Thank you. Um, and, uh, and we were, you know, we were, you were up against some stiff competition that yeah, year. Yeah, it was a great year. But we ended up giving you the editing award mm -hmm. um, because it was so fantastic. I don't think Penny. there is a composing award. Yeah, let's talk about let's that. Let's talk about that, Sundance. I, I might talk about that tonight at the IDA Awards. Yeah, let but, this be the beginning. Well, they are doing many. it. But I mean, I, I, I'm very frustrated every year at Sundance that they don't have that award. They have an editing award. They have a cinematography award. They have a directing award. But why would you? I mean, well, it's insulting. Well, little by little, they're getting more but awards. Sundance there was actually there used to not be an editing award, you know? Yeah, and, they're, and so. they're very forward thinking, and they run a whole composer's lab every summer that's I was right. renowned. Um, directors, what we do is we go, Sundance has, right. has you make uh, four, shoot four scenes from a script, right? So I shot four scenes from my film, Maplethorpe, um, upcoming film. And then you go away. You leave, yeah. they critique, critique, you finish the director's lab, you go away for uh, most of the summer. You come back in August and the weeks. composers are there. <coughs> right, right. And there's a composer assigned to score your scenes. Right. And it's, it's a lot of fun. And, and so they obviously get that. They understand that that's a big pro process of, of, the, of the film. And especially these days, like, the music is getting to be better and better and bigger part of films. I mean, if you watch, if you watch cable and you see some m movies that came out in the 80s or early 90s, it's enough to make your stomach turn. Like the music is right. unbelievably bad consistently. I was, I shouldn't say, I'm gonna say this, cause whatever, but I was watching <laughs> Thelma and Louise the other day. Okay. I shouldn't say this. Oh, you can say it. All right, well, I was watching Thelma and Louise. I love that film, it's, it's iconic. I saw it in LA when I was a kid, really young. And I didn't remember the music, I don't know. And I was watching it, it was Hans Zimmer score. Hans Zimmer is like a great composer and he's done some incredible work. But even then, this is 90, what was that, 91 maybe? Probably. It was just horrible. I mean, it's like these canned sounds. It just didn't, it, anyway. So we've come a long way. Can we delete that? I know. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna nice. say, say to you about what your one comment yeah. that I wanna make sure people yes. take away from this and all aspiring filmmakers out there. It's really, really important that the score does not compete with the film but actually supports the journey right. of the film. As a filmmaker, you know, one of the great goals, I think, should be, to, and especially a documentary filmmaker, because with a pre-scripted actor film, you can actually write continuity. With a documentary, you shoot all this different stuff, and then you have to somehow figure out a way to get it all pieced together, right, so that you never feel any bumps in the ride, so that nobody gets up and goes to the fridge, so that, you know, that's the goal. A score can destroy a film. I mean, it is absolutely, right. a, and I don't, I'm very sensitive to sound, and maybe I'm more sensitive than other people, but it's just the worst thing to happen to a film, because you've shot this great film, yeah. you know, you obviously thought it was great, or you wouldn't have taken years of your life to do it, hopefully, and then the c composition comes in, and it's, it's so often that you find that the score overwhelms the picture. Yeah. That's the that's um, job of the director and the composer, I think, you know, and the editor, for that matter, who's placing music, I mean, I battle with directors a lot. I used to battle to get more music in. Now I battle to get music out often because if it if it's wall to wall or if it's stepping too much emotionally on the scene, especially in documentaries. I mean that's it's it's a, it's such a fragile pro a little condition because there's so much dialogue and there's so it's all you know it's all it's verite and 
And if you come in with some out of place cue, it can just, just like you say, it can really hurt it. And I, I, I don't know, I, I definitely feel like there are times where I have to t speak to a director and say, you know what, I feel, I feel like we need to pull this back. There's, there needs to be some air in this film. Like there's, there's a scene and then there's a scene. And that's, that's an uh, that's a understandable tendency, I think, for directors to want to use a lot of music because you're creating story out of the air. You know, you're, you're conjuring as opposed to fictionalizing a story. So you, you have to keep the story moving and it's, it's the easiest thing in the world is just to plop a nice piece of music down under a scene and just let it roll. Well, as an editor, right? right. The, the, one of the most effective ways that I edit is I'll throw down a track and then edit to it. And so what I've come to do is ask the composer for a track to lay right. down. That's the best. Right. Um, and then I have the work of that composer already going, you know, and then, and, and I never want to put lyrics under dialogue. That's just, right. to me, anathema. It's hard. Yeah. So um, the music inspires but your editing you know process. How Paul, you know how you said, like, music is the, is, is the, um, is, is something I couldn't get away from. Like, somehow I ended up with music. It's not only because you're a musician, but music's, I think, the most important art form. And, uh, and I've always thought that, even as a filmmaker myself. I feel like music is the rhythm of life. It's the beat. It's the heartbeat. It's everything. So it's the foundation, you know? It's through music that you can subliminally start to think things. Through lyrics can come into your head when you're sleeping. Right. Um, so, you know, score is just, it's another, you've become a filmmaker now. That's the thing. I, is, thank you for saying that. I mean, I agree. I, mean, I think it's such a universal part of our being that anyone can relate to, you know, really. I mean, on, on, on many different levels. And I, what I meant to say earlier, and I didn't mean to rag on Hans Zimmer <laughs> that film, it's just the music has come a long way in film. And like the scores for docs, for feature films are fantastic. Some of my favorite music that's around in the world today is being done by composers for film. I mean, part of that might be because I'm a little biased now and I pay a lot closer attention, but uh, incredibly beautiful music. And I'm awed all the time, almost all the time when I go to see a film. I'm seeing incredible work. and. To have the IDAs recognize that tonight is a really wonderful thing. And I'd like to see, I think, I, I honestly, I don't understand why Sundance does not recognize it. I, I can't, if they can't spend the uh, extra five minutes. We'll phone it uh, in after. In fact, we'll see them tonight at the IDA Awards. Well, we'll, 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 we'll have just clobber them in the lobby <laughs> of people. the DGA. They, and they've been but, very supportive and they're great. But I, 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 I'm honestly baffled. I, I just don't understand it. Well, I, I want to um, I want to mention during our composing show yes. one more thing that is very important is that composers are becoming more and more important right. to filmmakers because since the record industry collapsed, and correct me if I'm wrong, everybody's desperate. So right. when you go and license an actual track, you can't actually negotiate very much uh, because that's one of the only ways they can make money now. Right. Nobody right. buys CDs, right? right? So, so they. You know, we don't have the kind of budgets to support um, a, a score that has 13 licensed tracks in it. We have to, so a composer needs to step in. Right. There's a lot of competition now. I mean, now you have Trent Reznor types, you know, coming in and doing great work. And it's a new event. He didn't necessarily need the money, but there are a lot of people that are, were in rock bands and were doing commercial music as well, and the, the well has dried up, and they're saying, you know, they're fighting for the spot, which has actually worked out great. There's so much great film music being made by people who traditionally wouldn't have been doing that work. Right. Yeah, and you can bring a whole nother whole sensibility to it. I just wanted to bring the business side of yeah. it in before we close our cultural business show. No, it's true. And I and I we do need to get to the award show because you yes. should win tonight. And I think it would be appropriate if we have a clip of Better This World. Yeah. Oh, I lovely. think it's the most fantastic Thank you. Uh, piece I mean piece of work I've seen in a long time. It's very timely and it, it's a wonderful film and the the women who made it, Katie Galloway and Kelly Duane de la Vega, are just top notch. And it was really lovely working with them. Yeah, the DGA actually uh, wrote me and said, Do you want, I know you're Paul Brill's, uh, full disclosure, you're Paul Brill's date tonight. I thought you were going to say something else. No, <laughs> just for my partner and your wife, you know. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> so we're going out to the IDA Awards tonight. Yes. But anyway, they wrote and said, Do you want to sit with the DGA, the Directors Guild, no, or no. do you want to sit with Better This no, World? And I said, us. And then they said, or do you want the DGA to sit with Better This World? I'm like, hey. That's, right. now we're talking. Look at the right. power it's a you great, have. Look great at you. crowd. Oh, no, I don't know. I was surprised to get that email, they, actually. You're the, 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 I'm the building, bomb diggity you're, do, but that's, you're the show's bridges. not about me. Building bridges. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's go to Better This World, shall we? Let's do it. Thanks, everybody. Okay.
We're just going to protest, Mom. We're not going to get in any trouble. They've been on the FBI's radar for more than a year. When they came to St. Paul, federal informants and undercover cops were already watching their every move. This case was investigated by the FBI and by the Secret Service as a domestic terrorism case. I wanted to go to the RNC to protest because I want to change the world, and I believe it can be changed. We felt like somebody had to, had to speak up. The documents we obtained today detail extensive use of informants inside protest groups. It's still almost like a dream. It's all right for an agent of the government to take him to the edge of the swimming pool, but not to push him in. I don't think it's a good idea to be a snitch for the FBI. They really wanted to make a difference, but they never were violent until he came into the picture. They don't want to hear the truth. They don't even acknowledge the truth. I don't know if the FBI and Homeland Security, since 9-11, they all went berserk and crazy. They're trying to do what? And the lawyer cannot fight, uh, like, entrapment. It's frightening, extremely frightening. It's scary thinking that you're a pawn in somebody else's game. So we are back from the awards show. They were amazing. Paul won. Paul won tonight. <laughs> Round of applause. Isa, thank you. Yeah. That, that was well And your done, speech Paul. was incredible. If you noticed, our clothes are still the same, too. So we haven't changed. No. Yeah. Well, we haven't changed We're since back. 15 years ago, man, when we <laughs> met each other. And then now, are you going to get a big head because you won tonight? Am I going to get a what? A big head? Oh, a big head. Um, I don't, I, no, no, of course not. No. No. It's, uh, the, it's about the work. It's about the work and the people. So and what's next? Day. And then we'll say goodbye to our fantastic what's audience. What's next? What am I working on next? Mm -hmm. um, I'm doing a film that is called Love Free or Die by a director named Mackie Alston that just got into Sundance and we're going to take it down there. And it's about Gene Robinson, the first openly gay Episcopal bishop. I love and, him. Yeah, it's fascinating. He's it's a fantastic. great. It's a really nice film, really beautiful, and um, I'm mixing it next week. I don't think he knows I'm here right now, <laughs> 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 but it's it's a lovely film. And and uh, and then Ricky and Annie are making a new movie about the pitch, the knuckleball. Oh wow! Which is going to be fantastic. It's the like, actual pitch. The pitch. Oh wow! They've got great access to um, Tim Wakefield and. I, I, maybe I shouldn't great. be announcing. <laughs> are they? Um, are they? Are they uh, big baseball fans? No. Well, it's funny though because Ricky's husband and all of their kids are big Red Sox fans, and I'm a big Yankee fan. And I've been riding them for years. We're always fighting about base baseball. And then she ends up doing this film with like the, one of the great Boston pitchers of all time. So it, it, they, it, it'll, it'll be funny. So you're saying you need some on-set visits yes, to it, really feel it. Yeah, it's gonna, it's, yeah I've, I've seen a lot. They finished shooting it pretty much. It's, it's going to be really great. Oh, great. Both of these films are wonderful. So, well, congratulations. Thank you so And thank much. you for taking time you, out of your busy yeah, schedule. It was such a pleasure to be here. It was a pleasure. Here, you know, and it was just lovely to see you. Nice to see you, too. Thanks, and thanks to you for tuning in. We'll be back next week with BYOD, Bring Your Own Doc. doc. Bring your own David Timoner. Bye, everybody. Timoner. Yeah, bring your own David Timoner. We'll actually have uh, my brother as the uh, guest on the show. Um, and the focus of the show, I mean, we feel like we should just Ever. get it out of the way, will be uh, my work. So we'll talk yeah. about that. And his work. And we'll be going to be, well, he's going to grill me, probably. <laughs> We're, I don't think we're going to talk about Dancing with the Stars too much, but oh, we'll talk about reality great TV. Editor and yeah, we will. <laughs> he did edit this film. He That's did. True. Oh, he's a, he edited this film too. There you go. Cool it. He's so a, he's a fantastic to be a great editor. Guy. Yeah, he's also one of my best friends. There and you go. we got to stop dangling. Bye. <laughs> we're out. Bye. Later. Peace out. <laughs>